Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us back in the Growth Institute for tonight. I will pray for us, and then we will start. Lord, we love you, and we praise you, God, for who you are and what you have done for us. Lord, we pray for this evening that we can honor you with it. Lord, that we will uh, remain faithful to your word and that we can be challenged. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. No cheats up here if anyone needs one. Sorry, I forgot to hand one to you. <laughs> so uh, tonight we're talking about leadership and prayer. Two more marks of a healthy church. If you remember, we were, we've been looking through the nine marks of a healthy church. Um, and these are two more that we're going to be covering tonight. Uh, leadership and prayer. And then next week we're going to be talking about the final mark, missions, and then starting then from next week, that'll be kind of like a jumping board into really just starting to talk about the mission of the local church and getting more into missions specifically. So we've been spending a lot of time on what is the church, what is the nature of the church, what is the purpose of the church, um, and then we're going to be focusing more on the mission then of the church in the weeks to come after this one. So that's where we're headed. Uh, but for then tonight's leadership and prayer, you can see goal for this week on your note sheet is to consider how biblical leadership and concern for prayer makes a local church healthy. A um, couple of things for review. Our ecclesiology. So if you remember, that's the doctrine of the church, what we've been studying this whole semester. And our missiology, study of missions, flow out of our doctrine of God, all things come out of the doctrine of God. What we believe and profess to be true about God um, informs our ecclesiology and our missiology. Uh, and ultimately, this leads to doxology, which is worship. So what is the end result of all theological reflection? It ought to be worship. Um, that's where we're headed. That's what we want to do is to grow our affections for God uh, because we have seen him work and orchestrate different things, different ways in scripture, um, in the church, and how we ought to do missions. So that's always like the large structure of how we ought to be doing theology. Um, let's fill in these blanks. These are the same as two weeks ago. Uh, a couple of them are. Uh, there are blank and <coughs> interpersonal spiritual disciplines. So you remember the first one? Personal. personal. Wonderful. Uh, there are personal and interpersonal spiritual disciplines. Second one, spiritual disciplines are Action. actions or activities. Activities, not attitudes, but they also, but they are also about being, not just doing. So they are activities, they are things that we do, um, but it's, they are also about being, and not just doing, because it ought to inform or affect who we are, help transform us to look more like Christ, and that has to do with our being, not just activities, not just the things we do. Um, Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, we see Jesus give the keys of the kingdom of heaven to the what? And in Matthew 18, we see the keys of the kingdom given to what? You guys remember? This was from, I think, two weeks ago. Peter and the church, yes. Uh, keys of the kingdom given to specifically Peter, or we could just say apostles. I think that's fair to say the apostles generally there, or Peter. Um, and in Matthew 18, we see the keys of the kingdom given to the church, and that's the text on church discipline where the congregation of the church really has the final say of who's in and who's out based on how someone is unrepentant or not. So we talked a bit about that two weeks ago as well. Are there any questions about any of this review stuff before we jump in the topic for tonight. All right, well, 
The topic for tonight should be relatively simple and straightforward. Leadership and prayer. Uh, there aren't many controversial things um, in our topic tonight. At least I don't think there are. We'll find out, I guess, as we uh, progress through this. Uh, but I think it's very valuable still. That's why we're spending time talking about these things. Um, <clears throat> so as it relates to leadership, I'm kind of cheating and talking a little bit more than just leadership because I'm talking about kind of like the structure of a church um, with looking at the different offices and then the, roles of a con the role of a congregation as well at large. So some of these things that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, we've kind of already touched on in different ways in past weeks. Uh, so some of this might sound familiar. And a lot of the passages I have here are passages we also have visited in past weeks as well. So it might sound kind of uh, repeated a little bit tonight, but hopefully that's okay. Okay, so uh, number one under here, under leadership, you might think we would start talking about pastors, right? Because pastors are considered leadership within the church, but I want us to talk about the congregation first. Um, we at First Baptist Church would recognize that we are congregationally ruled, which is why we vote on things to make large decisions as a church body, because we believe the whole congregation um, determines what we ought to be doing as a church. Uh, and so that's what we'll be spending time talking about first. So, you can see I have on here, it says, read the following passages and consider the ruling responsibilities God has given a local congregation of believers. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to read through several of these passages. And then I just, as we read through them, I want you to start making observations. Um, what responsibilities has God given the congregation at large? Uh, and we will... I think we'll read all the verses first, and then we'll come back and make observations. So, can I get a volunteer to read 1 Corinthians 5? When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus in my spirit and is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. All right. Galatians 1. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who calls you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be a Second Timothy. For the time is coming when the people will not do a sound teaching, but having interviews, they will stimulate for themselves teachers to seek their own disciples, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into this. Ephesians 4. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Right. There are several passages in here that you might not recognize right away how this has to do with the congregation, because it doesn't specifically use that language. Um, but if you put it into context, you're starting to see... Uh, such as Galatians here, Paul is writing to the churches in Galatia territory, which is a modern-day Turkey today. Uh, it was a Roman region, um, and Paul had visited these churches, or this region, establishing churches during his first missionary journey. Uh, and then there's these individuals called the Judaizers coming in and preaching the false gospel. So this is what Paul is responding to, these new believers were starting to be deceived by these Judaizers, saying that 
you could follow Christ, but you actually have to do this um, Jewish tradition as well. And so Paul's responding to the churches there. Um, and in this response, we could assume, or we could really pull from it, I should say, that he is assuming, Paul is assuming some sort of responsibility on them um, as a group at large for being deceived. So be thinking of that, and that also kind of ties into the Second Timothy passage as well. Uh, the same sort of idea. Uh, why is there, there there's, seems to be some sort of responsibility given to the congregation at large uh, for being at fault, for being deceived from those teaching them false things. So, so think of that, Galatians, Second Timothy, and Ephesians 4, um, the first verse prior, which you may already be aware of, uh, Paul says that God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers, then now we're starting in verse 12, to equip the saints um, for the work of ministry. So what are the saints doing here, uh, and how does that work out? So what are some observations that we could start making from these four verses, or passages, I should say, about the responsibility, ruling responsibility God has given a local congregation of believers? <coughs> Okay, so they have a responsibility to stay true to God's teaching. That's right. Let's look at first the First Corinthians five passage. That's probably the easiest one. Maybe. Well, this one is this depending on the power of the Lord Jesus. So they're supposed to be, you know, led by the Spirit and Jesus to do the things. But then it's discipline. Mm-hmm. Church. Yeah, yeah. So assuming, right? Because we believe in the priesthood of all believers, uh, that all believers as a congregation at large can discern these things of what is right and wrong, being led by the Holy Spirit, obviously definitely assuming those things. Um, and so the First Corinthians 5 passage, we see when it says, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord, um, they have the, the power, the authority uh, for church discipline here. So... They are the final say of church discipline in a local congregation. We spent a lot of time on that already, so we won't necessarily harp on that one a whole lot. But that's probably the easiest one to pull out. What are some other things we could observe? Well, just, I mean, just assemble as well. Yeah. The, I mean, the fact that we should assemble right is something. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We should definitely assemble. That's one of our responsibilities to God in order to uh, demonstrate, to show the unity that God has created, that there's no longer two, Jewish or Gentile, but he's created a new man, right? And so when we assemble together, uh, we are representing that. So that's really good. So Lorraine already kind of Hinted at one. Do you want to remind us what you had mentioned? Stay true to the gospel. So they have a responsibility to stay true to the gospel. Yeah. So they have a responsibility for what they are being taught. You can't just blame it on the pastor, or, I mean, the pastor gets to blame if they're preaching a false gospel. But if a congregation is just happily accepting false teaching, they're, they're at fault for that. Right? So it's the congregation's responsibility to fire a pastor if they're preaching false, falsely. Um, and then also to find someone who is able to preach biblically. What are some other observations? I think Ephesians 4 
we see a very explicit, um, and this is something we've already talked about in past weeks, that the congregation has the responsibility to do the work of ministry, uh, to build up the body of Christ. Uh, God gave the, the, the leaders, um, first the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, to equip the saints. So that's their role, but it's then the saints of the church to do the work of ministry. They're, they're to be equipped to do something. Uh, the saints, as in everyone, every believer in Christ, uh, to do the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain uh, to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to the mature manhood. So this is something where the congregation has a responsibility to hold us each other accountable. I mean, we've already seen that with the church discipline side of things, right? We have to hold each other accountable, but we're encouraging each other, right, to continue looking to Christ. That's all of our responsibility. It's not just the responsibility of church leadership. Uh, God has given all of us that those leadership responsibilities as a church at large. Uh, One of them is in Second Timothy. Seems like it's against the uh, uh, modern uh, consumer Christianity, which is I don't like what you're saying. I'll find a church that will say the things I like. Yeah, you said you, you see that specifically out of the Second Timothy passage. Yes, we're talking about people who want their ears. To, you know, to, yeah. Do or sound teaching instead they want to accumulate that suit their own passions. Yeah, that's right. So if you are um, committed to a congregation, a church body, which we all should be committed to a church body, um, if false teaching is starting to arise or you see someone, you could start off with a Sunday school teacher, right? Um, teaching things that sh maybe shouldn't be taught that isn't sound biblically. Um, maybe not just run off right away to a different church, but do the work of ministry and hold that person accountable and say, hey, I don't think what you're teaching is biblical. Um, we need to work for unity here and build each other up. Just a question on that then. So there are probably a number of topics that could be debated. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right. Um, so if you say someone sees something falsely, like where do you draw the line of stuff that it matters enough, it's important enough that I want to fire the pastor versus yeah. this is just something that we can disagree on because there might not be like a definite, clear answer, or maybe we just have a different interpretation of something. Hmm. But I'm not going to fire you. Over. You're, you're That's a good question. Uh, and with that. Uh, many times we'll talk about things that are primary issues, right? And then there's secondary issues as well. Uh, but then also, I think this is where it's helpful when the church has us um, uh, a statement of belief, right? Uh, when you have a confession and say, we as First Baptist Church believe this. Uh, and if you, as a believer, when you're joining a church and you, if you believe that confession to be true, that is what should unify us, our confession of who Christ is and what the church looks like. Uh, and so if a pastor is starting to deviate from that confession, um, that would practically, that's just an easy thing to look to and say, actually, he's not teaching these things. Um, should we amend the confession or should we look for a new pastor? Uh, and so that would be something the congregation would have to talk about. It would also depend on there are certain things that can be interpreted different ways, but there's also things that are just straight out sin. That's right. You know, so there might, you know, preaching something that's pro, it's definitely straight out of the Bible, diff, you know, yeah. op, in opposition. Like the Judaizers were doing, yeah. right? Because that's compromising the gospel, saying it's not by faith alone that you're saved. So, Primary issues. I, th I generally say when it has to do with the doctrine of God and the doctrine of salvation. Uh, when we're starting to mess with who God is and we're starting to mess with how do we gain access to God, 
you say Christ alone through faith alone, right? If you're starting to mess with those things, then those are more primary issues. Um, and then there could be a primary issue also for a particular church that isn't necessarily a primary issue for salvific purposes. So, like, for example, we're a Baptist church, so we believe in believer's baptism, right? I, I don't think if someone believes in infant baptism, they're an unbeliever. I think they're wrong. So that would be considered a secondary issue. But that would be a primary issue, though, for our church, for having a pastor who is teaching and practicing infant baptism in that Baptist church. So we'd have to probably find a new pastor at that point. So, comments on that. So, there are primary issues, right, that we would say are important for salvation. Like, you have to be, you have to believe these things in order to be a believer. If you don't believe them, I'm not sure if you're an actual believer. And then there's things that you have to believe in order to be part of our congregation, such as believer's baptism. All right, any other observations? Yes, Tyler. Well, I mean, just a, a clarification on a particular point. So what about like belief in uh, what the Bible is? I mean, that's not on either of the two topics that you, you mentioned as the ones that are critical, uh, who God is and the, the path to salvation. But it's uh, important. That's right. That's right. So I guess it depends what the person is saying about the Bible. <laughs> right? If so, like we would not have a teacher here in the church saying that the Bible is not an errant. Right? If, there, if someone was teaching that there's errors in this Bible and it's not fully God's revelation, the God's word, uh, we would not allow them to teach in, in our church. Uh, because that is uh, a huge... Uh, thing for us to hold on to, right? This is God's revelation. This is how we know God. If we're starting to question that, then what else could we actually... We we start questioning all of our beliefs because all of our beliefs come from Scripture, ultimately. It should be pointed out that we, as Christians, have picked minor issues that weren't clear or not in the Bible to make stands on throughout time that weren't that so you know we've picked you know oh you can't dance <laughs> or whatever you know that's you know those are that, silly things yeah yeah but you know I mean? you're but right that was you know, you know yeah uh, we have done stuff like that so there it has to be whatever it has to be you would assume would be supported by scripture that's right so i would say a primary thing is you have to believe in the trinity is that's very comes down to the fact of who God is. That's the nature of God Himself. Uh, if you don't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, you're believing in a different God. Uh, so I would say that's a salvific matter. Um, some Christians would actually push back on me on that, um, and that's a, a talk a quite, or a discussion to have. But so those are just some examples. Right? Um, so my list I have here is. The congregation has responsibility uh, to have the final say of church discipline. The congregation has the responsibility for what they are being taught. They're held accountable, right, for having someone teaching them false things. Uh, the congregation has responsibility to do the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. Um, and then kind of as like a subcategory of that particular one, like an implication of that, how do we do that? The congregation has a responsibility to pray and serve together. So are we praying for one another? Uh, are we seeking out uh, each other to hold each other accountable and continue pointing them to Christ? That's all of our responsibility. It's not just the pastor's responsibility, but it's all of our responsibility as a congregation. Again, this is why church membership is important. And for us to say we're going to choose to covenant together and do ministry together and hold each other accountable and continue pointing each other towards Christ. Because this is all of our responsibility. And if you aren't doing these things, if you're not praying for each other, you're not um, doing the things you need to be doing as a church member. <clears throat> Just biblically speaking. <clears throat> 
All right, next one, elder led. So we're congregationally ruled, right? So the congregation ultimately has the final say, but yet we still have pastors. Pastors, elders, they're synonymous terms, biblically speaking. Uh, overseer as well, um, all those terms are synonymous. Uh, so we're elder led. Uh, Read the following passages and consider the leadership responsibilities God has given elders slash pastors. So it's the same sort of thing. Uh, we're going to read through these passages and consider the responsibilities uh, that God has given elders in leading the church. <clears throat> so, who wants to read Acts 14? Titus 1. First Peter five. some of the responsibilities God has given to elders slash, past, slash pastors. The Acts 14 passage here, I, I put in here for a specific purpose, even though there's not like a, like a list of responsibilities for them. I want us to see something from there. Um, and then, we'll, so we'll get back to that. Titus is a list of qualifications you need in order to be a pastor or elder. Uh, the other list of qualifications is in First uh, Timothy chapter 3. I, I didn't put that one in because that's repeated largely from the Titus 1 passage. Uh, and then First Peter 5, we see more like actual responsibilities of, of elders here. So what are some of the things God has, um, what are some responsibilities God has given elders or pastors from these verses? That's right. Yeah, so we see that in Titus 1. So there's some qualifications there. There's some discussion there of like, well, what if a pastor's children or child, one child of a pastor grows up and denies Christ? Are they able to still be a pastor because their children are no longer believers? That's a question um, that many people have asked. My short answer to that question, I know you're not even asking, I'm asking for you, is that when um, a child is in your household, right, you're pointing them to Christ, sharing Christ with them, uh, but once they become an adult, they're off on their own, um, and they're alone responsible before God as an adult at that point. So, some people may not agree with that, but that's my answer to that. What are some other things we could see from here? Shepherd the plot, give instruction and sound doctrine and Wonderful. So yeah, they shepherd the flock. We see that specifically in First Peter. <clears throat> um, you said they, what was that other stuff you said? Give instruction and sound doctrine and rebuke those who contradict. Yes, and so then we see at the end of Titus. That's good. The end of Titus passage. What are some other things? Is Yeah, so they have oversights, they have leadership, they're responsible for the congregation, uh, for their spiritual welfare, uh, but they are not to do practice that in a domineering way, right? 
we know there has been cases of um, pastoral leadership abuse uh, and things like that, uh, just by practicing it in a domineering way, right? Uh, and pastors are not to be that way. But they're supposed to be examples in their lives, right? Living a holy, godly life before the Lord. That's why you have these qualifications in Titus 1, because they're meant to be an example. Does anyone see why I put Acts 14 here? Because they're appointed by the church. Appointed by the church. They here, I would say, is Paul and Barnabas specifically, um, in conjunction with the other disciples. Uh, so, so that's part of it, but that's not exactly where I was going with. What was that? They didn't, do it without they didn't do it without thinking, right? They're intentional with it because they know uh, we're responsible of who's teaching us correctly. Uh, I, I wanted to, this is just a kind of like a side note of I think what is best. If a church is able, um, many churches aren't necessarily able because of financial reasons or just may not have uh, qualified men, but if a church is able, ideally, uh, we would have a plurality of elders. Um, and I think we see that here in Acts 14, and that's what was intended. And when they had appointed elders, plural, for them, elders in every town, so there's plurality of elders in every town where churches were. And so that also points to um, a responsibility of elders in leading, that they're also accountability, they're also um, co-lead with others, I think is what's best. Uh, again, I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong or biblically sinful by any means if there's just one pastor of a local church, but I'm saying what's ideal, I think, is a plurality of pastors. I think there was an indication that they, that you saw the kings when they had ultimate power get, you know, taken in all sorts of directions, but if you have, let's say, a church and you have multiple elders, that there is you know, somebody to keep each other in check. Yeah. And also just to share the burden of teaching, shepherding, like congregations can get large, especially large congregations. Like I don't understand how one person uh, could be solely responsible, spiritually speaking, uh, for a whole congregation. But as we saw earlier, though, the, the responsibility of congregation is also to right, help encourage and point others towards Christ. But Ideally speaking, it would be a plurality of pastors, yes. When you say plurality of elders and pastors, do you mean like a bench of staff teaching pastors, or are you saying that there can be room for lay elders as well? There are room for lay elders, and I think that is ideal. Um, we don't have that here at First Baptist, um, but I, I think that would be a good thing, uh, eventually maybe, or if we don't, that's fine as well. But I think there is room for that. Uh, to have lay elders. And lay elders simply means non-staff people uh, serving in this type of role. Um, and I think you also see this in the beginning of Titus 1. So this verse 5, it says, this, uh, this is why I left you in Crete, so he's talking to Titus, uh, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders, plural, in every town. Um, as I directed you. So at this point, you could, there's probably a local church in every town or that he's talking about here, and there's a plurality of elders in each of those congregations. So that could look like staff pastors or <coughs> lay pastors in addition to staff pastors. In the last two churches that I were in that were larger, they had lay elders in addition to the senior pastor mm. that, were, you know, that led. there was a group on both of them as, and they were both Baptist churches it was not just the elders were the pastors mm. yeah. and, and, it, and not all the pastors were elders so sometimes we um, make distinctions mm -hmm. between those terms mm -hmm. today just for like the structure and the workflow, I guess, of the church itself. 
Uh, but my preference would be to always use those terms synonymously because that's how I see scripture do it. But it's not a big deal if they're used differently, I guess. So, Tyler. I, I just was, you know, you said that uh, when they're out of the house, that, you know, going back to, and his children are believers and not open to the charge. Um, but the two things it said were debauchery and insubordination. Those sound like pretty adult kind of things. And you also give into context the culture back then, the patriarchal nature and all of that. And I, I just don't think that your interpretation, I think it's more in line with where culture is today rather than what was said back then. Sure, sure. Yeah, and so we could have further discussion on that, and I, I could be wrong in my interpretation of it, and I could be swayed otherwise, but that's just where I'm at right now. Tyler, or, yeah, JR. So you said ideally you have people who are not pastors who teach. And when you say, you mean like get up on Sunday with a sermon? Is that what you mean? So the responsibility of pastor slash elder involves... You have to be able to teach God's word, right? We see that as one of the qualifications here in Titus 1. And you should be shepherding your flock. So it's just, that means having a care for the spiritual welfare of the congregation. So I think you could serve as an elder, a lay elder, um, having some teaching responsibility, say let's teach you in Sunday school class, and acting pastorally, checking in, uh, with members of the church, praying with them, discipling them, really th those sort of things. And I think you're fulfilling the role of a pastor. I don't think you necessarily need to be preaching regularly on Sunday morning. Um, that could be the senior pastor or the paid staff member. Uh, but I think you should be able to preach uh, if you needed to. So, And if that structure is already built in a local church, it makes it so much easier for the senior pastor as well. If he needs to take time for his family or whatever, it's going on trips, like there's many people there that are able to preach for you while, they're, while you're gone in your own congregation. But I don't think they have to necessarily be the main, or like you don't, you don't have to share the pulpit uh, equally amongst all elders. I don't think that is necessarily what's implied. Other thoughts or comments? <clears throat> All right. So, uh, congregationally ruled, elder led, and then we have deacon served. So, elder and deacon, those are the two offices, church offices we see within Scripture. Uh, so, that we're getting to this one now. Uh, read the following passages and consider the servant responsibilities God has given to deacons. So, deacon simply means servants. Um, and we see this given, this office specifically given to certain men. Um, so, there's only two passages here actually that I have for us. So, who wants to read the 1 Timothy 3 passage? All right, Tom, you can read that. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the history of the faith with a clear conscience and, and let them also be tested first. Let them, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons, they a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is Christ Jesus. Acts 6. Let's read that one. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching, of the, word of, preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Wonderful. 
Um, what are some observations we can make from these passages? So obviously the first one is, again, qualifications. Uh, we can make some observations from there. But then also Acts 6, we see um, several deacons, servants, are explicitly uh, asked to be chosen to fill a certain task. So, what are some servant responsibilities God has given to deacons? To serve. To serve. That's a good start. <laughs> Be faithful in all things. A lot of this, these qualifications are very similar to that of an elder, right? So what are some distinctions that we could observe? They're not teaching. They're not teaching. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's one of the qualifications we see in Titus 1. Being able to teach God's word, that's not mentioned here in this list. Both <clears throat> deacons and elders are supposed to be examples, right? We see that, I mean, their lives are supposed to be um, blameless, as said here in uh, 1 Timothy 3. So both are supposed to be blameless in th their example. But deacons are to serve more in just tangible ways. Um, <clears throat> the tangible needs of the church, there's so many needs of the church, um, so, that's all the same. Yeah, right. And I think that shows uh, that um, they're supposed to still be able to be an example for other believers, right? I don't think age is necessarily uh, an important thing here. Just like I don't think age is necessarily an important thing for the elder. Yeah, and that's actually the same point that Tyler was making earlier about the elder um, as well. But I think that's getting to the intent that you're supposed to raise your family in a God-honoring way, right? You're not supposed to be involved in these things that the world is involved in. Elder, uh, I mean, elders aren't to be drunkards, but deacons are supposed to be sober-minded. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the same. <laughs> <clears throat> so it's the same. It's worded differently. There's uh, some interpretation there. <laughs> sure. So I, I would say deacons, right, serve and support the ministry of pastors or those who are preaching and teaching God's word. Uh, we see here in Acts 8, specifically the apostles were the ones teaching and preaching at this point um, in the beginning of the church as elders were starting to still be established, uh, but they were to help support the work of those who were preaching and teaching the ministry of the word. Uh, so it's not like there's the ministry of deacons over here and the ministry of elders over here, but the ministry of the deacons is meant to help serve, I think, the ministry of the elders, so the elders are able to give more attention to the spiritual needs of the church, such as discipleship, right, preaching, those sort of things. Yes? It's, it's not a good example, but this is kind of why, you know, people have, like, administrative teams. You know, the boss isn't going to go do all this other stuff. He's got his own yeah. kind of focus and concern. So there is actually a real value to taking care of what you're saying, some of these more um, practical tasks, and, like, the, the distinction between needing to focus on the role of preaching, and then service roles as well. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, here in Acts 6, uh, specifically, right, was to care for the widows. Um, and that's, again, to support the ministry of the apostles here initially uh, so that they could focus on the preaching of God's word. So it's a supporting role. It's not, doesn't mean it's any less important <laughs> Right. Uh, it's very much important. I think a job of a deacon could look like administrative sort of stuff. Um, 
shoveling the sidewalks sort of stuff. Like wherever there's a need, they're willing servants. And um, I mean, we all should be serving each other. Again, if we go back to the purpose and the role of uh, the responsibilities of the congregation at large, we should all be doing these things and not just lay it off on the deacons and elders, right? But these are people at least that we've recognized to be um, good examples who are doing these things well. Any other thoughts on deacons? So, you might have heard Jason say that we are congregationally ruled, elder-led, and deacons served, and that's why we would say these things, because we think that's the way um, Scripture lays it out and how a church should be led and ruled. All right, so now, last 10 minutes, we're only going to spend prayer. Uh, this is what always happens when we're looking at two marks. We spend so much on the first one and then neglect the second one. Um, and you should never neglect prayer. All right, so what is prayer? Let's start with that. That's an easy one. What is prayer? Hopefully it's an easy one. <laughs> Talking with God. Wonderful. Um, could prayer look... Differently, could it take place in different forms? Can you talk with God different, in different forms? Yeah, Tyler says yes. What are different ways you could talk to God? In your head or out loud. In your head or out loud. All right, that's right. Um, what else? Corporate or Corpor individual. Corporate or individual, yes. Um, through song, through writing. I think those are things you could do. So it's really just, yeah, being... In communion with God, communicating with God. Um, I like this uh, definition here by John Owen, just because I like John Owen, so I, I put this in here. Uh, prayer is a gift, ability, or spiritual faculty of exercising faith, love, reverence, fear, delight, and other graces in a way of vocal requests, supplication, and praises to God. So we see making requests to God, making supplication, and also praising God himself. So I'm going to take all those forms. So now I have three questions here for you, kind of back to back to back. How does prayer work? What is its purpose? And how should a local church pray? So those are the three questions I want us to consider. Uh, there's so many passages that I could use for uh, obviously talking about prayer because prayer is talked about a lot in Scripture. Um, so I just try to select, I don't know, ones that I thought gave a wide variety of different ways it was talking about it, but I don't know if I was successful at that. So here, Psalm 107. You see there's a lot of verses there, but yet there's only one line. It's because all those verses are the exact same in their one line. They all say the exact same thing because the psalm repeats itself. It says, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. So we see a call, a prayer to God, and then God delivers. So how does prayer work? I mean, you cry out to God, and he, he answers. Uh, Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Does anyone want to at, read that one? All right, so, I mean, this is just showing that God is, the Father is eager to hear, right? He's saying, ask, and you will receive. If you seek me, you will find me. And this is uh, truth that um, God is right there for those who ask, for those who seek. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, let's read that one. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, 
so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So here Paul is talking about the thorn in his flesh, whatever that might be. That might be uh, maybe his eyesight, maybe some other physical difficulty. Uh, but we see here Paul prayed to the Lord to um, heal him really in this way. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this. Um, I wanted to put this one right after Matthew 7 to show the contrast that just because you ask doesn't always mean you will receive what you ask, right? Uh, there's a certain purpose of why Paul did not receive what he asked for here in Second Corinthians because God had a purpose in his difficulty, in his ailment, in his thorn in the flesh, right? Um, so that Paul could learn more about the grace of God here. So there's that. And then Matthew 6. This is obviously a famous passage with the Lord's Prayer. All right. Um, let's start with the first question then of the three. How does prayer work? I mean, it's not necessarily a, a complicated question. It gets us closer to God. So that kind of answers more of the second question, right? I mean, it kind of works together. What is the purpose of prayer? It helps us get closer to God. Um, what are some other things on either the first or second question? One, it displays a, a, a sense of faith that he exists because we are talking to, to him. And therefore, if, if we are sincerely praying, we are sincerely believing he's hearing. That's right. And I think he allows us to voice our frustrations and stuff and our questions. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and then, so going off of what you just said there, right, we, we are reminded along with Peter, or with Paul, I should say, in uh, 2 Corinthians that his grace is sufficient for us, um, even when we aren't strong enough, because he is strong enough for us um, on our behalf. That's good. What are some other thoughts? And the point that, uh, that we disagree is I believe prayer changes things, not mm -hmm. just us. I believe prayer changes things, but the, uh, not just us. the nuance of it is maybe a little bit different. So what is the purpose of prayer? I will say this, Lonnie. Uh, the purpose of prayer is to glorify God by praying for God's will to be done here on earth. So I think when we pray, we ought to be praying in alignment with God's will, and that's how God, in, through our prayer, God accomplishes things, even if it isn't just us. So I would say that, but we need to be praying in alignment with God's will. And so maybe that's where I would point it. So if it's in alignment with God's will and we're praying it, God is being gracious enough to allow us to participate in this great plan of redemption in this world to carry out his purposes and that through our prayers he's a He's going to be working in this world. Uh, so he does that. Um, but if we're praying for something that's not according to his will, it's not going to happen. Just like Paul was here. It wasn't God's will for him to be healed from his thorn in the flesh. So it's not going to change that. Uh, but prayer does change things when we uh, pray in alignment with God's will. Tom? Yeah, to that point, because you, you ask it, what is its purpose singular? Mm. You ask the question, what are its purposes? Mm. You could get, I mean, if it does change things, I mean, it does affect the believer, but it also can affect change. Mm. So, you know, sure. you, how you ask the question. That's fair. Yeah, that's good. Maybe I should make that plural. I, just, I think there can be multiple yeah. purposes of prayer. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, there's a lot of outcomes, a lot of implications, maybe of a singular purpose, in the sense that. I mean, really, there is one singular purpose of all things, that of what we are to do with our life is to honor and glorify God. But the implications in the way we do that um, could have many different answers, I think. 
Uh, so we glorify God by praying for his will to be done, for things to be trans- to change in this world as he carries out his purposes, but for us also to be changed internally. That's to glorify him also. Yes? Um, so when you're talking about answered and unanswered prayers, um, I always have had this question, and it's how does the will of God conflict with himself? And I'm thinking about the prayer in the garden. Take this cup from him. Yeah. I would say uh, Christ, right? He is fully God, fully man. Uh, if you were here several semesters ago on the doctrine of God, I don't remember, we talked about it. We call it the hypostatic union, to be fancy. Um, but Jesus is fully God, 100% God, 100% man. Uh, so he has two natures in one person. Uh, a nature has a will, is what we would say, at least what the church has said throughout the history of the church. Um, what is orthodox is to confess that Jesus, in his one person, had two wills. Divine will, that's never changing, right? Always perfect. Uh, the one he shares with the Father and the Spirit. And then, because he is man, he assumed a human nature and he also had a human will. So in that moment, when he was praying in the garden, uh, that's uh, with his human desires and his human will praying that. Uh, not necessarily desiring for him to contradict God's will, but in the flesh, right, in that in that time, recognizing that pain and that sorrow, praying that with his human will was for it to, for the cup to pass from him. But knowing, since he also had has God's will, that that's not going to happen, and he's going to obediently go to the cross. So that's how the answer that question has been answered historically in the church before. So I'm sticking with that. <laughs> On that case, also, it shows that he knew what he was going to have to suffer and to willingly have to take. It wasn't that he wasn't going to realize that he was going to suffer. He is it's showing you that he knows that this is going to be a suffering yeah. that he will have to do. For that's right. Redemption. I think that's right, Lahani. Yeah. So let's get to the third question to finish up today. Oh, we don't have any time, but how should a local church pray? How would we say this? How should a local church pray? So when we gather, I mean, what was that? Frequently. Frequently. We should be praying frequently. We should be praying together. Um, So that's why I think it's important when we gather together as a church to pray. And this is why it's also important to have public prayer in a worship service. It's the way we can make our requests and concerns known to God together as a congregation. Um, I think our public prayer life like corporate prayer life, I should say, um, should flow out of our individual prayer life also. Um, we need to be praying as individuals, and then when we gather together, we can make prayer requests also to the, fa- to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. Um, any other thoughts on how should the local church pray? Um, I mean, there's a lot we could say here, but we also don't have much time. <laughs> Good question. I don't know. I don't know when they stopped. It stopped before I got here, I think. So. There's some that still meet. They meet on uh, Sundays. Before. That's right. We the prayer team meets uh, on Sunday mornings, the first Sunday of every month. Um, so, but I do think we could pray mo- more. I mean, you can never pray too much. That's wonderful, and I greatly appreciate that. It's very much needed. Something I learned about sort of like, you know, like the family prayer, church prayer time is um, to be transparent and not to Mm. say things like, oh, I have an unspoken prayer request. That's just horrible and that's not going to serve anyone. And just say, hey, here's my prayer request and here's what it is. And be specific because Mm. it might be that someone else has the exact same problem and then you guys can mutually help each other. That's good. I, I, yeah, that's wonderful because prayer shouldn't just, like, prayer is a way for us to grow together as a congregation as we're doing life together holding each other accountable right helping point each other towards christ and that's a wonderful way to do it and so if we just always have unspoken prayer requests we have this idea that it's just me and and jesus which is is true but there's a whole church family that god has given 
you to serve and to do life with. And so, yeah, some of it is sensitive if it's not yours to share. Sure. With the group. Well, yeah, so if it's not yours to share with the group, I think. I think that's often the sure. Well, see, and that's case. another thing is keep it within the church. You don't need to pray for your neighbor's cousin's brother's dog. You, you know, and, and I don't say that to be callous. You know, it, it's, it's to be like mm. you're saying instructive and to build each other up. And if you and your friend and like you're, you know, you guys want to pray privately, fine. That doesn't necessarily mean to be. If you're, if you're going to bring a prayer before the church, yes, you mm. should be open about it. Um, and if it's sensitive, then yeah, you talk to your pastor about it first. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it could be. Yeah. Open. So yeah, it's just when you're being brought up, then I think is what the point is, right? In a corporate church gathering necessarily. Um, but then I think you could still, if you want to keep it in a smaller group, you could pray in the Sunday school class for a particular thing as well. Um, if someone wants to have it just kept in that but I mean each case is different I guess uh, there final thoughts or comments on anything a comment and, and a thought is the same thing so I asked the same thing twice but yeah. that's right all right if there isn't any if you have further questions we could talk afterwards I did put this um, little thing on the back side to prepare you for next week, this little article. Sorry, the print is so, the font is so small. So hopefully I don't destroy your eyes by you trying to read that. All right, let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this time that we have, Lord, uh, that we had to look into your word, to think about the way you have established your church, Lord. We pray that we can be faithful um, in all that you have called us to, Lord. I pray that we won't uh, step away from any of the responsibilities you have given us all, Lord, as church members, or as deacons, or as pastors, Lord. Um, I pray that we could serve your church, your bride well, Lord, so that when you come back, she can be um, holy and acceptable to you, Lord. Uh, we pray these things in your name. Amen.